<laughs> All right, now with our uh, lead-up hitter now in studio, which hopefully we can get the uh, the mic or the, uh, the camera to actually look at him, uh, Mr. Joseph Ferretti here. Joe, leading off. Thank you, Rob. Well, I'm going to pick the low-hanging fruit uh, from the news last night that our governor has endorsed uh, uh, more capito for the governorship here in the state of West Virginia. So the question certainly is, uh, how is this going to potentially tip the scales. Let's look at this a little bit. With regard to the governor, we know he's very popular. Uh, past elections, he beat Ben Salango 63 percent to 30 uh, percent. He beat Bill Cole in the 2016 race. Uh, when the governor was a Democrat, he won that race. And, and a beginning red wave in this state, he beat Bill Cole 49 to 42. And in the primary in 2020, he beat two Republicans and doubled them up in terms of vote percentages. So the governor is very popular in this state. I think that's beyond dispute. Uh, the endorsement game here is a little intriguing because the governor uh, previously endorsed Morrissey over Manchin uh, in a previous race. And then also uh, we have uh, not only Moore Capito and Shelley Moore Capito endorsing Governor Justice, Riley Moore is endorsing Mooney. So a little intrigue there in terms of uh, the family split regarding these endorsements. But the long and short of it is, does the endorsement by the governor of Moore Capito now tip what is a very fractured and very tight race for a governor in West Virginia? The latest polling, Rob, shows... And this is from the Rex Repass slash Metro News poll. The latest polling is that uh, Morsi has a 31% share, more capitals at 29%, and then uh, Chris Miller's at 16%, Mac Warner at 12%, 10% un undecided in a poll that has a plus minus uh, le leniency there of about 4.9%. So is the Capito... Uh, endorsement that he received from the governor of justice enough to tip the scales in his favor for this race. That's our first question to discuss, and with the first discussion point, Larry Schultz. Yeah, I I, I do think it is. Um, that, that those numbers have improved since last week. In fact, for more capito, last week it was I want to say thirty one twenty three, and Metro News was asking, could this be the start of something? And looks like it is. Um, I don't particularly care too much for between these two guys. You could probably tell I'd take almost anybody but either one of them. However, um, given that, I would rather have somebody who's a native of the state be the governor than it's somebody who's not. And, um, I mean, I've lots of relatives and friends in New Jersey, but I'm not begging them to come here and run my state. <laughs> so... All other things being equal, uh, this looks like uh, good news for more capital. Mike Height. Uh, I'm going to say, yes, this makes a huge difference. For, for whatever reason, Jim Justice is loved by the people in this state. Um, and, and some of us, uh, you know, question that and say why we, we just don't get it you know there's always these accusations of you not paying his taxes of doing this doing that and for whatever reason the people here love him and he gets re-elected or elected and re-elected overwhelmingly um, uh, uh, against other candidates so uh, it's hard to say that that kind of endorsement doesn't weigh huge um, but the interesting thing about the more capito campaign is it seems like that was a grassroots campaign that sort of came up by itself it didn't have the endorsement early on it is making inroads in if you believe the polls it's making inroads into the morrissey lead all by itself um and and gaining traction and where i thought you know maybe chris miller would start to gain some traction no it hasn't been it's been more capita the whole time and and gaining steam and more and more and more now now that the, the polls are showing that he's close and you get an endorsement like this, this is huge. This is a game changer. And uh, I think Morrissey needs to be concerned at this point and, and should probably consider coming back to the debate table with only a few weeks late, left in this race. Um, 
you, you don't want something like this to get away from you. So the Morrissey team needs to take this serious um, because, uh, like I said before, I believe this is a game changer. Billy, you have to pull the, pull the mic to you, remember? Yeah, I think uh, it will be a game changer. Uh, justice is very popular in the southern part of the uh, state, probably less so up here, uh, but very much so in the southern part of the state. A uh, point that you made uh, about perhaps Marcy should revisit the debates, uh, one of our commenters last week said, you ignore the eastern panhandle at your own peril. And I think that's probably what Marcy's has done. But other than the endorsement of justice, which I do believe, and I agree with uh, with everybody, that it is uh, quite a game changer, quite a boost for more capital. But even more than that, I think the poll that came out last week was a harbinger of what is to come. Folks like to vote for winners. A part of that poll, it appeared that Marcy was running away with it. Cap, more capital buried at 12 or 13 uh, percent. There was no real reason to vote for more capital with those lower numbers. That has changed now. Uh, he's, uh, he's very competitive with Marcy. In fact, if you look at only the those that vote uh, as nonpartisan or independent, uh, more capital has something like a 35 34, 35 to 26 percent lead over Marcy. Uh, all of these th suggestions that Marcy, who had it, had his way for quite a while, I think is in real trouble. Mike Carl. Well, I, I can't deny that that it's helpful to uh, more Capito to get to get that endorsement. I, uh, pe pe but I, I people just don't understand. Uh, all that's wrong with justice and that, that he adds, you know, to the support uh, uh, for more capito, you know, it's just another, you know, I don't know what it means really, but I, I, I basically it, it, it'll, it'll, it, it'll help uh, more capito. And, and I, and I think uh, 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 Riley Moore ought to, uh, or or Morsey ought to you know emphasize his support from Riley Moore. Joe comes back to you. Yeah, well, Mike and I, I agree. Uh, the support that the governor receives uh, is baffling to me because uh, he does have a lot of baggage. I mean, he's probably the only governor in the country who has property seized, wages garnished, and doesn't pay his sales tax receipts to the state, uh, and has his own state tax department now putting liens on his property. Uh, it's, it's, but that doesn't seem to resonate with anybody, and his popularity is undeniable. So there he is now endorsing uh, uh, more capito. And I, I, the political pundits always say big mo, big momentum is always key in these races, and you get the sense the momentum is with more capito at this point, not only garnering this uh, endorsement, but also this 15-point plan he came out with last week about how he's going to improve education in West Virginia. I have to believe this is a sophisticated operation. He's got the top Republican as his mother, and, and the top Republican in the entire state, uh, probably helping him a great uh, and to a great extent in terms of how this campaign is being run and how this is all being rolled out. The timing seems to be pretty pretty choice here in terms of this endorsement. So. I think the momentum is behind more capito, and I suspect it's going to carry the day for him. Let me ask you, uh, Bill, if, uh, um, in regards to the type of voter that might be swayed by Governor Justice's, and in, in all the room, Ju Governor Justice's endorsement. So at this point, early voting starts May 1. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the total undecided population really is in the state in terms of these four major candidates on the Republican side. But what type of voter might be swayed by a Jim Justice endorsement? No, Bill, good. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the poll reflected this. Uh, the the, end of the those other than a hard to the right, I think will be swayed. In fact, I think Justice may even cut into that margin as well. Uh, I know a uh, good friend, Mike Carl, uh, questions and the impact of a Jim Justice endorsement. I do not. I think a Jim Justice endorsement has a fairly wide cut. But let me make another point. Uh, I think it's gotten Marsh's attention. Uh, 
Marcy is a through Black Bear, a pack that supports Marcy. The ads have been pretty negative, have been very negative, but they've been directed toward one person. Uh, the Black Bear ads have been, negative ads have been directed toward Chris Miller. Starting this past week, they've been directed toward more capital. My kite. You spend 60 days in Charleston. For most of the people of the Eastern Panhandle, the governor is kind of viewed as, you know, he's the governor of West Virginia. Okay, when the state's doing okay and in some places, in other places not so much. But the attitude toward him once you get toward Charleston and South is much different and more passionate than it is in the Eastern Panhandle, is it not? Oh, I believe it is. And I think, believe it or not, people, I think people relate with him, you know, not – not that they're billionaires or millionaires or whatever he is now, but um, a lot of people in the southern part of the state are, are going through struggles and, and hardships. And they look at, at uh, the governor and say, well, he's just going through struggles and hardships just like the rest of us. And uh, they relate to that, that old shucks mentality and, and you know, his, his affable nature. Um, they relate to that. Uh, so in, in that part of the state, and I'll, I'll say from, you know, Clarksburg, Bridgeport down, um, I, I think he has a tremendous amount of support, and, and people just see him as, as being another West Virginian. So uh, his endorsement brings brings a lot of weight, no pun intended. When you asked uh, what kind of voters are going to be attracted by uh, his endorsement, the first thing that occurred to me was hee-haw fans. Um, <laughs> I know I personally would rather see him on a remake of Yeehaw than on Meet the Press as my senator. I, I just got to say, he can be a funny guy. Um, you know, you can't. Um, I couldn't stop laughing when he did the whole baby dog thing. I like Bette Midler, but it was pretty funny. <laughs> I don't know what that has to do with governing West Virginia out of its terrible problems. And uh, for that reason, I, I, I can't imagine People do like him, though, and I think they like him pretty much the way they liked the guys on Yeehaw back in the day. Well, people, I can guess. I used to watch the part of the state. I think look at it as he's one of us, mm -hmm. and and Morrissey not so much. Well, and that's my that's my point in regards to that endorsement. If you were on the fence and you weren't sure, you know who was your person, and maybe Morrissey was a person you were supporting because he's a prominent Republican in the state statewide recognition as the attorney general for two terms, mm -hmm. ran against Senator Joe Manchin, came close to beating him, too. With and, the endorsement of justice. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Which which has now changed, right? So yeah. if, 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 this, if the justice name means something to you and you were kind of on the fence, this, might this turn you? This, this all just uh, really upsets me uh, uh, and diminishes my respect for West Virginia voters in general, or certainly the ones who would, are supporting justice. Uh, it's just disgusting. Well, it, 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 it has that, that air to it, Mike, because I think West Virginians, by and large, are play-by-the-rules kind of people. And let, let me bring up the name of Isaac Spinagle. Remember him? He sued mm -hmm. the governor for not, not following the Constitution, once. not following the state Constitution, and living in the seat of government. He was the original Jefferson County Commission. Yeah, and the, and the governor contested that lawsuit, then caved, entered into a consent decree, paid Spinagle's attorney's fees, okay? So basically, you know, I give up, you win, you're right, and said he would live in Charleston. And then he went about thumbing his nose and not living in Charleston for the last how many years? The guy doesn't play by our rules, and to me, that's the very essence of being a West Virginian is you, you have, you're accountable for what you're doing. You play by the rules. This guy doesn't. And that's why his popularity just it, it amazes me that he has this kind of popularity and pull. But it's undeniable. And it's, it's, it says more about the judgment of our voters or poll, poll responders than it does about him. But uh, Go ahead, Mike. COVID rules. He's just working remote. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mike, uh, I think each voter is receptive to a different button that's been pushed. Uh, and I do not believe the voters w walk in lockstep. Uh, there's a lot of voters that 
do not view justice as being the devil incarnate. They view it as as very effective. During COVID, he was effective, uh, humorous, relates to the people. There's a lot of attractive aspects of, uh, of Jim Justice, and I think those attractive aspects will, will influence or uh, more capital will benefit from those attractive aspects at, with endorsement. Let, let, let me say that uh, more capital was a little kid played in my house in Charleston, and if he had announced his his candidacy before uh, Morrissey had gotten into it, who I committed to, I would be supporting more capital. So I'm all for more capital. But this this defense of justice and the and the people who support him and why they support him is just disgusting you know the other curious thing is i I, morrissey doesn't have a bad record when you start looking into politics and you look at records very good he doesn't have a bad record at all so you you sort of wonder you you have to attack him somewhere else because you can't attack him on his record it's it's been pretty clean he's done a lot for west virginia all right bill you're on the clock with issue number two after the top of the hour break this segment brought to you in part by the berkeley county health department's quick Response team, this is Talk Radio, WR and Martinsburg, and TV 10. Someday the mountain might get them, but the law never will. Yeah, okay. Set up the stubble, Eddie. All right, we're on to issue number two, and with that, we go to the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, the. Uh the Republicans have held with a supermajority uh, both the House and the Senate for the last 10 to 11 years. The last election, there were more and more uh, being elected that would were not what I would call the mainstream Republican. Uh, the forms the last couple or so days, I saw that more and more prevalent. Uh, there were the incumbents were being primary to the right, or in every one of the, uh, uh, the forms, there was someone that I would consider to be very much to the right on social issues, uh, more so than what we call the Chamber of Commerce Republican or the, the mainstream Republican. My question, I'm glad Mike Heights here today because he can address this uh, up close and personal. My question is, are the mainstream Republicans at the risk of being surpassed by the more right-wing social Republicans? Let's go to the man who just came back from 60 days in Charleston and uh, was in the mix, Mr. Michael Hyde. Um, I mean, sure, there's always that 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 possibility that that more and more people to the right um, get elected. Um, it, you know, for me, it's about finding uh, quality people to run down there, and and even the ones uh, that that I serve with who I would consider. Um, far right or more to the right than than i am um i find that there are times when i can find common ground with them um the ones that i fear the ones that are so hard right that they're unyielding um that they they can never see uh someone else's point of view uh or or change the way they view something so um i'm hoping we don't elect anybody like that uh you you this is Politics is a game, whether you like it or not. And if you don't learn how to play the game, you, you're very ineffective down there. So uh, people will, will ostracize you quick if you come off as as arrogant and deliberate and and unyielding. So uh, you know, even the ones that uh, that are are very hard right down there, I have seen some changes from their year one um, to year two. Um, which is interesting, and one in particular, I won't call him out, but one in particular um, started, I, I would say, uh, going with leadership a little bit more and, and trying to be more uh, a compromise and, um, you know, got, got more accomplished this past year. And to his, uh, to his surprise, um, was rated even higher of a conservative this year than he had been last year by some of the the conservative uh, people who who rate us um, and gives us scores. So um, he found that uh, he became more effective by by being a little more yielding. Larry Schultz, this is also an issue not just in the West Virginia legislature but in the Republican Party writ large, especially in the Congress of the United States. Just this morning, we we heard talk about. Um, Speaker Johnson 
and how he may be tipping toward the Ukraine side with Democratic votes uh, to approve the funding uh, for Ukraine. There is a, a terrible sort of a rift between two groups of people in both of these legislatures, and it, you don't see very many people who cross over from being a social conservative to being a shall we say, Chamber of Commerce conservative or a fiscal conservative or whatever you want to call it. And so there needs to be somebody in leadership needs to create a pathway where these people can go back and forth because otherwise it becomes a third party. And once you have three parties where you only had two before, the numbers will start to look ugly on some of these things. Now, obviously, that's a lot more likely to happen on the national stage more quickly than it will in West Virginia, because we took quite a while to move over to this, um, to the Republican domination that we see now. Uh, but, it, it, yeah, it's, um, I think the danger is more for the West Virginia legislature because the majority is so much bigger. You could have a significant number of people... Uh, refusing to go along on certain Chamber of Commerce conservative ideas and still pass the bill because you have such a large majority in the in the legislature. You know, that's a little tighter uh, in Washington. You make you bring up a really good point, Larry, before we move on to my Carl here. And that is that typically you don't see a splintering unless you have a supermajority like you have in the West Virginia House of Delegates and the Senate. The Republicans have taken a, upon themselves in Washington, D.C. to apply the principles of a supermajority splintering to a, uh, an advantage that's only, what, plus two, plus, plus three, uh, when, when you look at it as to how these votes are breaking down. And it effectively is rendering, rendering Republicans ineffective in Washington, D.C. because of it, Mike Carl. Well, I, I'm glad to hear Mike Heights uh, reply or, or report from his experience on the ground with these people. The, the social conservatism is just a marginal aspect. And the leadership in Charleston, in both houses, was strong enough and clear enough to, to, the reason they are in the leadership is because of what the Democrats did to the economy of West Virginia for decades. And they have fixed it, and, and they're not, not going to let anything distract from it. They'll, they'll you know, play some games and, and uh, you know, uh, like, like uh, 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 our Senate president mentioned about the, in his ads about the uh, abortion uh, initiative that, mm -hmm. you know, that after, the, after the Roe v. Wade was overturned. That they took here, you know, but it it was a balanced thing. It was, it, you know, and and so there'll be a little lip service to the social issues, but the economic policy issues are the ones that matter to West Virginia, which we're still the poorest state in America. Joe Ferretti. Well, uh, Bill, I think your question uh, is twofold. One, you're, you're asking, uh, is there a development occurring where the social conservatives, the cultural warriors uh, are getting a better foothold in terms of state government? And two, I, I think implicitly you're asking, is that a good thing? Uh, first of all, the answer to your first question is, I think you have to, a good guy to ask that question of is John Hardy, right? Um, who I think on his way out of the legislature was was expressing his dismay at the fact that there seemed to be too much focus on some of the cultural issues and not the more pragmatic issues that bedevil this state to this day, like education, child welfare, infrastructure. Those are the things I think most West Virginia voters, whether you're blue or red, you'll want to see action on those issues. And just looking at this latest campaign, the flyers you get in the mail, some of the uh, debate forums that you, you guys have conducted and devoted a lot of time to, you get the sense that this is some kind of purity test going on uh, in, in these primaries. And, and it's a shame because I think a, a vast majority of West Virginians would be benefiting from their elected leaders keeping their eye on the ball and trying to solve some of the more serious problems that we have in this state. So I, I, I think... Yeah, there's a danger that we're going to maybe drift too much towards some of the cultural issues because of some of these folks who are running and espousing the importance of those issues. And secondly, I don't think it's a good thing for the state because, uh, again, we've got big issues to solve. And, and for me, 
uh, if I'm going into a voting booth, and I won't be doing that here in West Virginia, unfortunately, but when I go vote on somebody, I'm looking for somebody who recognizes the important issues and wants to solve those and you know, leave the other issues to, to another day. And I think uh, the voters of West Virginia, I hope they'll do the same. Bill, back to you. Yeah, labeling we kind of dismiss, but there's a, uh, I think labeling carries a deeper meaning at times than what we would like to see. Uh, taking Rhino, for example, uh, at one time uh, Rhino was uh, directed for folks like myself when I was a Republican uh, that, that would not go full bore with some of the uh, doctrine in the Republican Party. Now it's extended to a different group of people altogether, extended to folks like Mike, Mike Height, who I would never consider to be a Republican name only. He's, he's a man of principle, but yet he's been labeled rhino because he's willing or has the courage to vote for some some issues that are not as, that's in keeping with a more extreme part of his party. All right, we move on now to issue number three, and for that, Delegate Michael Height. All right, I'm going to move on and, and talk a little bit about the uh, the debates we've had here on WRNR over the past few days. And um, and just ask, now that we've seen all the those debates uh, of the local races in particular, um, what was your takeaway from the debates, and did anybody in particular stand out in those debates? My takeaway was that many of the candidates needed to move closer to their microphones and talk into them. <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> that would be my first takeaway on this one. There, there were one or two exceptions to that. There were one or two, but um, <laughs> there were nowhere else to go with that one. All right, uh, for the first response in on this one, let's go to Joe Ferretti. Cause just I want to see that mic slide back and forth. Okay. And well, uh, I two of the uh, debates if you will, um, struck a chord with me. I thought the, of all things, the Board of Education race in Jefferson County, uh, is it Donna Joy and James yes. Southern? Southern. I, I thought they did a remarkably good job of focusing on some of the pressing issues in education and explaining how they would attempt to solve them. And I liked their approach. Uh, too often we see people who are running for office and they advocate burning it all down and starting over. These folks, no, they, their approach was additive. Okay, they, they wanted to figure out what are we good at and how can we enhance those aspects of, of the Jefferson County educational system. So I liked their approach. I liked their ideas. I thought they were um, uh, certainly non-threatening to probably a vast majority of voters. In, in the county over there, and I suspect that either one would be a good selection for those seats in Jefferson County. Contrast that with the, was the 16th Senatorial District and, and Craig Blair, 15th. or 15th, I'm sorry, and, and Mike Folk. Um, Tom Willis. And Tom Willis. Uh, that was a, there was a food fight quality to, to that, to that uh that discussion and with a lot of accusations and barbs and you said this and you're lying about that and i frankly got very little out of that and i thought that was a missed opportunity for those three gentlemen because this is a chance you know with a radio audience to explain why your vote uh the vote for you should matter uh for those in the 15th senatorial district and i think they failed to get that point across uh i, I didn't hear a whole lot about some of the more important issues we were I mentioned here earlier. Uh, I didn't hear much discussion about that. It just seemed to be a lot of fighting and hair pulling, and it, it was unfortunate. So, those two kind of those two stood out to me in terms of the contrast. Larry Schultz, I think that um, first of all that um, since uh, Craig Blair has not one but two opponents, I do not know too much about Mr. Willis. But that's a benefit to him in this primary. He, you know, depending on how it shakes out, he could win with 34% of the vote. Um, and when you have a three-way primary and it's if it gets tight, um, you don't need to get a majority. And so it, I think that helps him some. I don't think it's too helpful to the other two, uh, to the other two candidates because he's obviously better known. I watched a, a good bit of that uh, particular debate, and yeah, we, we 
to go back to the previous question, there are some lines being drawn between culture issues and practicality. I thought Craig Blair did a pretty good job of staying on the practical, let's fix the problems thing and getting away from the you're a loon and you're crazy and you're a liar um, stuff, which I don't know why politicians do it because it really very seldom works. Unless the unless the people listening already know that the person is a loon or a liar, then you become a truth teller. But <laughs> if you're if you're just insulting the other candidate, I don't think you're I don't think you're crossing any bridges. No. Yeah, three or four of the races stood out to me as being the contestants took their job very serious. They did not come in throwing stones. They laid their issues out. I thought the candidates for governor did just that. They, uh, all of them acquitted themselves quite well. Uh, they have disagreements, but they have, they personally, they, they like each other and work well together. I thought the uh, prosecuting attorney the same way, both uh, uh, Joe uh, Kinzer and Jason Stedman, I thought knew the issues and they were they were quite professional in the way they conducted it. I was struck by a Board of Education, Melissa Powers, who last time she ran two years ago was this bomb thrower that uh, Joe Ferretti just alluded to. Uh, she's seasoned. She's learned a lot. She came in and gave what I consider to be a, a not a, perhaps not a polish, but a very, very solid performance. Then that is contrasted uh, with that uh, uh, with the uh, 15th senatorial district that just been mentioned. I don't think any three of them uh, showed themselves to be above the fray. Probably of the three, Craig Blair, I thought he showed some restraint, which is kind of unusual for Craig at time. But the restraint that he showed, I think, benefited him quite well. Uh, and then the last race, the 91st, uh, the winner for that one, I thought, was Tammy Hess. Uh, she sat back and let the other two fight it out. When she spoke, she spoke with, with some knowledge, and, and I thought she was uh, quite uh, – uh, solid or very measured in her response. Uh, I thought we saw some good candidates. I saw some candidates that make me nervous should they be elected. Mr. Carl. Well, I have to admit I, I wasn't able to follow much of the much of the debates you're talking about. Partly the local government, uh, our law firms, so involved that we we don't get involved in those politics uh, any more than than we have to but but uh i'm 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 still a big uh supporter of craig blair i i uh in fact i i just wonder and i'm disappointed that he has opponents at all back to you mr heights yeah i have to agree with a lot of what has been said um that with the governor's race itself, I've said all along, I think uh, these are all quality uh, candidates, and I think they showed that in the debates. Um, so uh, it, it, that's a hard pick um, for a lot of people. Uh, and I agree with the senatorial race. Uh, you know, two of the candidates uh, seem to be on the attack. Their, their campaigns are on the attack. Their mailers, uh, their ads are all on the attack. Um, but they're challengers, so you would expect that, right? Sure. And um, but as as a a voter, I a lot of times want to hear about the candidate themselves, not not always attacking the incumbent and, and their record, especially when you're attacking sort of weird issues. You know, when you when you come out with your your slogan is duty day Craig Blair um I sort of question that you know I know I know Craig Blair he's he's the the not just the senate president he's the lieutenant governor and um the the reason that he is afforded extra duty days is because he has additional duties to perform that the rest of us don't have now this is a man who's who's sold his business and has taken this on as more of a full-time job than most have in the past and i think 
that the reason that West Virginia is moving forward the way it is is because of that. Now, people can disagree with that, and that and that's fine, but that that attack seems to be sort of weird. And and then the whole chemical casterization um, seems weird as well. You know, I. I was there for that vote. That that is not how that went down. That that just seems uh, very inconsistent and and a weird attack. Um, and, and if that's what you're going to base your campaign on, um, I, I I can't see you winning. You need you need to tell me why you're the best choice and quit uh, you know bringing up these weird things about the incumbent. Um, and when it came to the debates itself, uh, I thought the 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 two challengers. Um, seemed angry at times, whereas Craig sort of took the high road. Now, I would agree that that's not always what you expect out of Craig Blair, um, but in this particular debate, he sort of took the high road and uh, talked more about his own accomplishments uh, than, than trying to, to uh, answer the attacks. I think it's a fair statement, Mike. Uh, Rob, one of the races we've been watching, and, and of course I don't think there was a, a debate uh, in your scheduling this past week, but I think one's coming up with Patricia Rucker and, and Paul Espinosa. Monday at 9 o'clock. Yeah, that's one we're, I'm sure a lot of people are looking forward to. Yes. Yeah, it'll be here in the studio. And to reiterate, uh, we were not attempting to try to get all the constitutional offices in the state of West Virginia. We, we had our aim at governor. Uh, we were not going to be able to uh, accommodate, accommodate the other races at the state level. After governor, then our job was to try to get as many of the local candidates as possible. Um, in, in some of the, the, the offices like assessor or whatever, uh, we weren't really going to go for a debate uh, form uh, type of format for that because it, it's not something that lends itself to a political arena. It, it's, it's, it, it doesn't really fit the format, but we'll gladly do those interviews here on the show before Election Day comes around. And for the others, uh, if the person had to work and couldn't make it, we've invited them to be on the program separately to be able to uh, offer up their positions on things. So you mentioned the Jefferson County Board of Education, Joe, the Berkeley County Board of Education. The uh, All of the candidates were not able to attend, but the ones who were, if we, if, as long as we had two who could attend, we were going to go ahead with that part of the forum. And let me just prove uh, I'm not above being a suck-up. Uh, uh, hats off to you and, and to Bill and to John Gilstrap and the others who participated in those debates. I, I've done it myself with the radio station here. I know it's difficult to come up with the questions because you, you want to craft them in a way that you really get to the essence of the issues with these candidates who are well-skilled in trying to talk around things. So I, I thought that was uh, an informative uh, effort on, on everybody's part to get out the information from these candidates and get them, you know, talking about the issues as best you could. Now, in some respects, they didn't do it, but in, in many respects, I think they did, and that's of value to the community. Well, and we mentioned that the 15th appeared to be more of a combative uh, hour than some of the other ones, and, and a lot of it had to do with the questions because of the commercials that are running that are saying that, you voted for this, you did that, you're paying yourself too much. We wanted to bring those questions because those are the things people are talking about. We wanted to give uh, the candidates who are accusing uh, the other candidate of doing these things the opportunity to, to have their questions heard, and we wanted to give the person being accused the opportunity to answer those questions so that everybody could hear them because uh, in the 15th, those are some of the big issues that are being brought up by the challengers. I've talked with um, political advisors, you know, and, and – um, people who help uh, candidates. And one of the things that the best ones, it seems to me, are able to get their candidates to do is it's not that you're not, you don't have criticisms of Mr. Blair. If you're running against Mr. Blair, you probably do. After all, if you're 100% happy with how he's doing it, why would you run? Sure. Um, so you do have criticisms. But with the criticism, you must attach your different solution and if you don't it i don't know that people are necessarily schooled on this but they intuitively say okay well what's your plan and they hear nothing and they say okay you got nothing <laughs> all you are is a critic Good point. we don't need a critic we need somebody who has a different plan to come up with a better solution and, on that, and we don't have that. On that note, we stop. Larry Schultz is on the clock with issue number four coming up after the break. This segment brought to you in part by the Mansion Ferretti Law Offices, now moving in downtown Martinsburg, and uh, also by CMA Honda. We're back with uh, more after the news. 
This segment of our program today brought to you by Elder Care Attorney Danny Staggers. If you or a loved one are concerned about going into a nursing home and losing assets, get in touch with Danny Staggers today in Martinsburg at 304-267-3915. And now with issue number four, we move on with Attorney at Law Larry Schultz. How long will the New York City uh, hush money case proceed before Trump violates the gag order? And what will the judge do then? I should add to this that there was some news later last night. Two jurors that were selected in secrecy without their name, you know, being uh, published, um, came in the second day after they were picked and said, I'm out. (laughs) And one of them was a nurse from Manhattan. And just that little bit of publication, that nobody put her picture on TV, nobody put her name on TV, that little bit of publication, Fox News amplified it, and she started getting calls from her own family saying, is this you? <laughs> and, and, and other people saying, is this you? And she said, that's just way too much, that too soon, I'm out. I'm not doing this. And, you know, she felt a little bit threatened. Uh, they were mocking her answers on Fox News one of the things she said was, I don't have an opinion about the case. I do believe um, no one is above the law. And, of course, the Fox News commentator was saying, well, that's your number two. I don't know about her. And pretty soon she starts getting the phone calls. I think the judge needs to watch what he's doing here a little bit and start holding back all that information. You know, age, leave it out. Gender, and that's it, basically. Uh, You know, juror number two is a woman. That's all you need to know. Uh, The public does not need to know and does not have an interest in the actual identities of the jurors. And you're talking about something that could be really, uh, really bad. Uh, And uh, I don't even know how you recover from it. It's an attack on the system itself. So, um, yeah, I just put that out there as a sort of additional part of this. I have a jury question for the three attorneys who are in the room because I've heard this two different ways uh, from reporters who aren't lawyers. So when you're selecting a jury, the one reporter I heard earlier this morning said it's going to be difficult to find 12 people who don't know who Donald Trump is. That's that's not what you're looking for here, uh, correct? That's just, yes. What are you looking for, Joe? Yeah, that's that's not the standard. Uh, the standard is that even if you recognize one or both of the parties who are litigating in front of you as a juror, can you still maintain impartiality? Can you be fair? And that's a question that the judge puts to just about every juror that I've ever selected uh, in a case. Uh, because ultimately, and it, let's say in a small community like this, uh, my uh, in, former partners uh, sued uh a fair number of businesses in, in this town over the years. And business people are, are well known uh, for many reasons in, the, in this area. And we were always concerned about jury selection. And people would invariably say, yeah, I, I've frequented that business. I know the owner of that business. But the judge would always come back and say, despite all that, do you think you could be fair and impartial? And by and large, most people can and want to be fair and impartial. And we took them at their word and they sat as a juror. So yeah, if you, if you know Donald Trump, that's not disqualifying. All right, so let's keep the mic with you and the first answer to Larry's question. Well, Larry's question is an important one from, from this uh, notion. Fundamentally, the right to a speedy trial, the right to a fair trial, of course belongs to the litigants, but it belongs to all of us. The interests of the public are served when there are fair trials. We all have an interest in that. This is a unique situation with a former president sitting as a defendant. Uh, I grant you got you got to understand that, of course. And it's also unique because he won't shut up. And he tweets and he has press conferences and he goes after people. And so uh, this is a unique situation where you've got uh, an element of danger, as Larry uh, points out, with these jurors who are going to serve if their identity it becomes known. And now we've got at least one media outlet who seems intent on identifying these people somehow and then going after them. That does not serve the interest of the public. That does not assure us of a fair trial. So the judge has his work cut out for him. Uh, To Larry's point, 
uh, will Trump violate the gag order? I believe he already has. I think there's going to be a hearing next week on that very issue. And I think the judge is going to warn Trump that if you continue with this activity, whether you're quoting other people who are claiming that the jury's being stacked with liberal activists or you're actually you know, saying something yourself, he's going to be held to those to that dissemination of information. And he's going to be told if you continue to do it, the sanctions are going to start at first financial, and eventually the judge is going to have to say, I do have the power to incarcerate you if you're going to take it this far. I think those words might actually be spoken to a former president sitting in a courtroom. It's unfortunate, but it's necessary. And finally, I'll say this. With regard to uh, the concern with these jurors, Trump's own attorney said in court yesterday, Your Honor, I will represent to you that he that my client will not go out and comment any further about jurors or what have you. And the judge looked at that attorney and says, I don't think you can make that representation. And it was not critical of the attorney. It was critical of the man sitting next to the attorney. And that was the judge disclosing, I think, his insight on this and his thought process, which is he's going to have to tamp this down in order to assure a fair trial. Mike Carl. Well, I agree with most of what was just said. Uh, one, the, the, the incredibly unique aspect of this is the confluence of a criminal trial in the United States with all the rights, you know, of the accused and all that goes with it, and the confluence with that with a with a active presidential race. You know, we were right in the middle of it. And then, of course, Trump's personality makes that confluence even even wilder. Uh, but I would say, don't ever forget the right of the accused to a fair trial. And the judge needs to deal all the other, all this disclosures and warnings and everything else. The, the right of the accused to a fair trial is essential and has to be remembered. Mr. Stubblefield. Talking about slippery slope, uh, since 2016, a lot of what we consider to be the norm has been thrown out of the window, and this is just one. Uh, not uh, not making an editorial comment other than just the fact we have to look at things differently than what we did a few years or so ago. There's a First Amendment right, so the uh, uh, Trump can say and represent himself uh, the way he chooses to, and if he's curbed, then there's a violation of his First Amendment. That is counted, though, with the, uh, the fair trial. What does it take to have a fair trial? How much outside noise can you have before it violates the premise of a fair trial? This is where we come with a slippery slope. Uh, what, we would, uh, what we consider today to be somewhat in the norm as recently as 2016, we would never consider it. We have come that far in a way of thinking on not only this issue, but a lot of other issues. Part of your question, Larry, was what will the judge do? What can he do? I think anything he tries to do, he's going to be subject to broad criticism and possibly an overview by more uh, a higher court. Uh, the old Chinese saying, let us live in interesting times. We certainly are today. Mr. Height. You know, this particular uh, lawsuit is probably the most disappointing of all the lawsuits that I have seen against uh, Donald Trump. This is a, a misdemeanor offense beyond the statute of limitations that has been manipulated into a felony offense for campaign finance violations. Um, it, it's just a weird case all around. I, I get the one in Georgia. I get it. But this one, this one's really, really weird to me. And, and I don't know why a, a, a judge would even go forth with this particular case, other than the fact that the judge himself has shown to be uh, partisan in nature. Um, the man is still innocent until proven guilty. He's asked to go to his child's high school graduation, and was denied. If this had been anybody else, they would not have been denied. They would have been allowed to do this. This judge is by far 
way too partisan. And and this is why I think the 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 general public hates this, that this is not justice and they don't see it as justice. So, I, you know, I, this whole th- as far as the gag order, no, he will not be able to shut his mouth. That has been proven over and over and over again. He will say something that he is not supposed to say because he's been given this gag order and there will be repercussions because of it. And this particular judge will probably be harsh in the repercussions. So uh, that's what's going to happen. But all in all, this is very disappointing. This isn't justice. Comes back to you, Larry. Yeah, I, I, I understand what Mike's saying. But of course, if you don't want to have your speech limited in any way, Live your life so that you don't end up being charged with crimes. In other words, (laughs) they had to have probable cause to bring this. It wasn't just totally made up out of nowhere. And so the charge gets brought by either a grand jury or by in a prosecutor's discretion. And now he's faced with this situation. The difficulty is if he's allowed to lean in and send messages to the jury or send messages to his followers who then send threats to a jury, then you've really got a banana republic uh, uh, problem uh, with our criminal justice system. No matter who you are, and including if you're wealthy and well-known, you have to answer to these questions. Um, I don't share your view that it is without merit. I'm pretty sure Mr. Cohen knows exactly why he borrowed money against his house and gave it to Stormy Daniels. And he's going to tell that jury exactly why. Now, they'll have every opportunity to cross-examine him for being a felon and and for all the things that he went to jail for. Um, But that's how trials are. Um, I don't see this as an overreach. If anything, I see the long delay as an underreach, which New York City in particular was guilty of for 40 years with Donald Trump. Uh, You know, he never seemed to pay any price for any of the stuff that he did for all those years. Maybe they're going to play and catch up, but there's a lot of stuff they will never be able to bring. I know you believe that there's merit to this case, but would you agree you may be slightly biased in your opinion? Sure. Okay. I, I probably sure. couldn't sit as a as a juror in this case. Mm-hmm. However, if you've got a situation where somebody's out there working to identify jurors so they can publicize their identities and thereby engender threats against them, like the threats to Nancy Pelosi, the threats to all kinds of people who've opposed Trump over the years, then you must put a hammer down to stop it. And, I, I mean, I, I think Donald Trump is smart enough to gauge his responses so that he doesn't go to jail during his own trial. But I'm, you know, prepared to be surprised. <laughs> yeah, let me uh, – uh, yeah. Uh, Mike, your question gets to the heart of where we are today. We're in such a polarized society. You're taking the position that the judge is partisan – by definition, probably biased, and the results. Let me before you say, and as results, the uh, whatever comes out about it is going to be a function of a kangaroo court, if you will. We have exactly the same situation, except flipped, in Florida. Uh, the classified evidence. Uh, the judge there is perceived to be also partisan, also biased, and they anticipate if whatever the results would be, it's going to be swayed in part by, in this case, her political leanings. So I think it's very difficult now to find something that we as a country will agree as a fair, impartial judicial decision. We didn't have this a few years ago. We had a lot of faith in a judicial process. We have less so now. All right, let's move on to our final issue, and for that, Mr. Carl. Well, I'm going to make it real quick, and this is just a question. Do you agree that the anti-Israel protesters who blocked 
major U.S. bridges and highways to express their opposition to U.S. support of Israel do not have any First Amendment immunity from both criminal charges or from civil liability to the thousands who were hindered in using the public transportation. Mike, let me first commend you because I thought for sure when you started off with do you agree? The rest of that sentence was that Joe Biden is the worst president. <laughs> no. You're branching out. No, I like I it. Know. <laughs> he already knows what we think. I, I, but I think it's an important issue. I agree yeah, with I you. I, I totally concur. Joe Ferretti. Yeah. Uh, as a point we make often on this show, uh, Rob, First Amendment rights have their limitations. You can't disrupt commerce. You can't disrupt transportation uh, and people moving about freely, uh, just like the students who... Uh, up in Columbia University yesterday staged a, a protest and disrupted classes and, and activities on that university campus. Uh, there's only certain ways you can, you can uh, uh, utilize these rights uh, that are fundamental but have their limitations. And these folks will, will, will suffer the consequences, I think, in terms of prosecution. Uh, you know, back in the 60s, we had students going and taking over President uh, offices, presidential offices on campuses and disrupting things, and they were arrested. So uh, it, it's, it's a lesson we learn often, the limitations of those fundamental rights. Mike Heights? Yeah, I, I would agree with everything Joe said, that, that your rights are limited. You can't disrupt that. These people need to be arrested just like they were in the 60s, um, and, and that's not happening enough. That would deter some of this, uh, but they do need to be made examples of. And just to let people know that, uh, you know, there's a, a, a right way and a wrong way to protest and, and disrupting uh, commerce and and travel is not the correct way. Um, you can say your piece without having without doing all of that, um, and they need to be prosecuted. Mr. Schultz, yes, um, we we have a perfectly good example on the other side of um, the January six protests. Except, in addition to blocking commerce and traffic, they committed assaults on police officers. <laughs> They defaced the capital of the United States, and they have been and should be um, um, prosecuted for that. Your First Amendment rights run out about the time you pick up a club. <laughs> and in, in, to enforce your words, you start hitting the guy on the side of the head with a club. That's Now your, your First Amendment rights are in the distant past. Um, and you've you've moved it to a different level. And, yeah, I think there should be some prosecutions. I think they can um, be selective about it, maybe go after the leaders and the organizers of it, as opposed to uh, the January 6th thing where we started with all the, uh, all the uh, participants and there were only going to be years uh, getting getting to the people who led and, 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 and started it off, I would like to see that order flipped. Um, but, it, yeah, I don't think there's a problem with some prosecutions. Now, 30,000 people, that's going to bog down anybody's court system. Um, we only had, what, a, a few thousand at the Capitol. And so, that you know, there could be a problem. You might have to have a tax increase to pay for all the additional courtrooms. But, um, sure, there, there's no... First Amendment right to be violent or uh, obstructive. Mr. Stubblefield. I'm going to be the minority in this case. Uh, I do not think disruption of traffic is enough to uh, warrant prosecution. Uh, we have, uh, if there's some destruction of property or if there's a threatening of life, then that's the case. What we had in Richmond, there was prosecution there for not the masses disrupting traffic. That was because they were destroying, uh, destroying property. Uh, I use the term slippery slope several times, uh, and I think this really applies. Uh, where's disruption of traffic? Someone stands on the uh, sidewalk disrupting people from walking by. A few years ago with a trucker strike, they would, uh, or a trucker commerce uh, strike, truckers would stop, would take, uh, uh, block up, block the highway, that was disruption of traffic. Where do we begin? Where do we end? I, gluing your feet to a, my, a bridge is obstructing traffic. If, if you question whether these people obstructed traffic, 
uh, it's stunning. Mike, one of the things that I enjoy visiting with you both on Thursday morning and here is that if I do not agree with you, I am wrong. There is a lot of gray area here, and I don't really think that we can and we can casually say because of the disruptive, uh, disrupting traffic or blocking traffic, they're going to be prosecuted. I just will not go that far. But isn't Mike, that breaking the law? Aren't they breaking the law by doing that? Well, Mike, we do a lot of things that we don't get break the law. Every time you drive 56 miles an hour, you're breaking the law in certain places. And, and, and I'm so, subject to being pulled over and fined for doing that. Yeah, but you're rarely pulled over. There's so many things that we have at this point in time. And what has been lost here is their message. The message that caused them to take this action. If you'd phrase your question differently, Mike, I think that would have had more uh, uh, a deeper meaning. Are we is a populist right in justifying or or petition against Israel? That I think is is the question. I like, I like the way this show is starting and ending. Bill started the show by telling Riley to ignore my questions, and he's ending the show by telling Mike to stop asking his questions the wrong way. <laughs> I, 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 Bill, I like the way you've wrapped that up nicely. If, if you if you were a law school student in the constitutional law course, you'd get a big F right now. <laughs> I probably would. That's, I, that's not the only course I got F's in, Mike. <laughs> I, I think that's not the only big F Mike is trying to deliver right now. <laughs> this uh, final thoughts are coming up next. You get eight seconds of peace here. We want to thank uh, our folks at LA Roberts Jewelers in downtown Martinsburg as they are sponsoring final thoughts for the day today.